There we go. There we go. Awesome. Good to see you. Good, good to see all these faces, all these happy faces, all these friends. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Saturdays with Eddie. Hey. And uh, today is uh, Saturday, October 21. We do this every couple of weeks just to uh, touch base, talk about options, uh, strategies, talk about the market, see what's happening, uh, answer questions. So it's uh, basically your show. It's uh, not, not really for me, it's for you. And the idea is to just help each other out and see what kind of um, education can we get to help us get a dollar in the bank. Uh, maybe even with a few zeros at the end. If this is your first time, obviously, um, you know, do your research. Um, make sure you tread carefully as well as trade carefully. Uh, we're all about risk management. We don't like losing money. We understand that it's part of the game, though, that that we're going to lose some money. However, when we do lose, we want to make those losses very small. So we talk about how to fix that. How do we prevent uh, ourselves from losing a lot of money? Basically, we want to keep what we make. Uh, this is for educational purposes. I am not a licensed or certified financial advisor, so you might hear some some big words, but uh, it's just because I read the Wall Street Journal and I listen to important people like Clarence. So that's 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 it. <laughs> uh, you know, he just told you the first lie. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> which, which means that I might tell a few more fibs, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and, well. We, we we like uh we like the humor so uh the jokes are free by the way you don't have to pay for those uh <laughs> you know and if you have any of your own by the way you know drop them drop them up there over there so all right so what do we want to talk about today we're going to build a small agenda this is going to take roughly 30 45 minutes maybe even an hour uh but what i have in mind i have in mind uh talking about some of the charts that we're looking at what's the market doing why is it doing what it's doing? Uh, and then I also want to address the beginners and ask, you know, how are you guys doing? What are things you should be doing? What is the deal? Uh, you've heard that uh, this is a side hassle that you can make, you know, plenty of dough, but you're not seeing the dough. What, where is it? What's going on? And then um, if any of you have some hard questions or topics, let's see. Uh, anybody got something on their mind that they want me to cover today? I kind of have a burning question, Eddie. If you don't mind. Well, talk to me. What's that burning question? So, learning from you and learning from others, we never look at the bond and treasury. We don't really, I mean, I, I haven't heard you say that that's important, but every time I'm on CN, CNN, CNBC, or, or any of those Fox networks or anything like that, they're always talking about how the bond market and treasury market is somehow affecting the stock market. And I don't understand the correlation. I don't understand how what that has to do with individual stocks. Can you please explain it to me? Yeah, we'll 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 talk about that. So the people who talk about bonds and treasury are actually folks who spend a lot of time doing the financial analysis. Uh, most of you, I believe, are technical analysis people or technical analysts. You look at the charts, you look at the trends, the history, and uh, you know that history does repeat itself. And with a fair amount of certainty, you can kind of project where things are going to go. Fundamental analysis or analysts on the other side, they look at uh, what's happening on a macro, macro scale, macroeconomic, look at uh, the country, they look at uh, international, they, they want to see or they want to tie social political events to the market. So something like bonds, we know that when bonds are doing well, what does that mean? It means that people are basically putting their money towards, uh, you know, safer, safer haven, if you will. Bonds historically have been, you know, instruments that that don't don't fluctuate in value too much. So when you want to preserve your capital, meaning that you are sort of afraid or you're sort of scared that you know there might be you know huge swings you want to preserve that capital and the best one of the best ways obviously is to is to invest in bonds and treasury so with tre treasury there are different instruments there's treasury bills there's treasury notes right now i think they're paying uh, roughly 5. Point something percent which is you know pretty good uh about a year ago, they were about nine point something, uh, nine point six percent. 
That's some of the highest we've seen in recent history. The reason that Treasury was so high was because uh, the market was kind of tumultuous. It was uh, not doing so well. So people could you know, put money there and come back later. Uh, of course, there are limitations. So when you're buying Treasury notes, you have limits of, um, I believe, $10,000, if I'm not wrong. Anybody know about uh, treasuries and all that? Yeah, you, you can invest up to $10,000 per year, which is pretty low, in my opinion, for a lot of people who have got disposable income. So what uh, we end up doing is you buy at least one for each of your family members and you buy one for your cat and your dog uh, <laughs> and your neighbor, right? So there's ways to get around it, uh, but it's basically one social security for every 10K. Um but there, there, there's some there's some ways to get around that. Not 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 too fancy, but uh, it's a nice way to get 10% of uh, return on your money, just doing nothing. Now there's limitations, obviously, to taking it out. If you take it out before one year or before the term, then you will lose at least three months worth of that, right? So it's you you do have to hold it for a year and a little bit longer than that. The relationship between bonds treasuries is that when the treasury yield, yield here refers to what the profits are uh, on those instruments. When the yield is high, it means that everything else is tanking, right? We go to treasury to preserve capital. We go there to, uh, you know, get some more money because the stocks are not doing so well. So when the treasury bills and the notes and all that are doing well, then the stock market obviously is not doing so well. And when the rates are announced and you see you go to say three point something percent or 4%, I think that's what it was uh, last week, then what happens? People move their money there. If those yields go down, then money moves back to the market. So we might see when those yields go back or go up, there's an inverse relationship because they're paying better. What do you do if you own stock? You sell the stock, you go buy the treasury bills, right? So the, the the usual effect is when that treasury yield goes up or is perceived to be going up, then you will notice in the market that there's going to be a drop. Sometimes it can be a sudden drop. Like last week, uh, it could have been last week or a week before, we saw a sudden drop around 2 o'clock p.m. when the, uh, the yield, the treasury yield spiked up by just a few percentage, uh, you know, tenths. Of a, of a percent, not even one percent, but uh, you know, just to give perspective, uh, zero point one or zero point two percent of a lot of money is obviously a lot of money, right? And who's trading those institutions, uh, in individual investors with plenty of money parked on the side to do something? Uh, a good example is uh, uh, some people may have their emergency savings in those kind of instruments. Yeah. So if you have uh, an idea about emergency savings, they always teach us uh, to do what? Three to six months of expenses. Yeah. Three to six months of your household expenses. That means you have to have a budget. You have to know how much your monthly expenses are. Key point over there. So once you figure that out and then you calculate that you need about three to six months, what do you do with that money? Do you go invest in the stock market? Bad idea. Bad idea. Don't do that. Instead, you may want to invest in, uh, you know, instruments that don't go so high up or so low. They're not they're not as volatile. So that's why bonds and treasuries. Once they, you know, that yield is attractive, you might find a lot more cash moving that side. So, Linda, I'll just to answer your question, that's long winded. The relationship here is that bonds, treasuries going up translates to stock market going down. So when you know that those rates are going up. What do you do? You're buying puts, you're buying put debit spreads, you are uh, selling calls because you know that uh, there's a cap there. So three strategies that you could do that. You could you could sell calls you know, instead of a call credit spread. You could buy puts uh, or you could buy a put debit spread, one of those. Uh, or you could do various things. You could do a caller or you could do some, some, some fancy spread. But anyway, all that and more. Uh, that's what we talk about inside of the class. So hope that hope that helps. Thank you. You answered like three questions for me. Cool. Now you, you did bring up another question. We I was actually talking to my wife last week 
and we have emergency three to six months worth of emergency money in the bank and it's just sitting there. Would you suggest buying a one of these treasuries or bonds? Well, that? I don't, I, I don't give financial advice, so I can't really tell you what to do with the money. Uh, I can tell you what I would do. Uh, right now, money markets are paying roughly 5 uh, or just under 5% which is a much, much better place to put your emergency fund, right? So emergency fund here also suggests that you're not going to touch that money for quite a while. So yes, I would, I would, I would, well, here's the key. Emergency also suggests that if you need the money in a pinch, you need to have access to it, usually 24, 48 hours or something like that. So a treasury uh, bond or treasury note would not be the right thing. You know, as, as I'm thinking more and more about it, that's not the right thing. The reason for that is remember that you have a one-year commitment minimum, right? You have one-year commitment. So if you have an emergency and that's and your emergency fund is inside of that one-year commitment, then taking it out would, uh, you know, obviously put you in a bad spot because first and foremost, you lose out on the interest that would have been paid. Uh, second, you've got some penalties. Uh, it's not that you can't get your money back. It's your money, right? It's just that it's going to take you a little longer to get it and it's going to be penalized. Kind of like taking out your 401k before you're 60, 59 and a half or something like that. Bonds on the other side, uh, they're, they're actually the same, same thing. If you take them out early, then you... There's this penalties, this penalties to that. Uh, CDs, I see somebody's asking about a CD, also falling in the same thing. So here's what you could do, especially about CDs, is uh, you, can, you can do a CD ladder. CD ladder. So a CD ladder is, uh, instead of, let's say you have an emergency fund of, uh, I'm just going to be, Modest here, say sixty thousand dollars, right? So you have a household in a household budget of five thousand. So twelve months emergency fund would put you around sixty k, right? Easy math. So instead of buying one CD with a whole sixty, you could buy six of them, or you could buy ten of them. So if you bought ten of them, it means that you have got six thousand dollars on each CD, and they are each expiring at different times uh, of the year. So you could buy a one-year CD, you could buy a six-month, you could buy a three-month or several of them, a combination of that. But the idea here is that uh, each CD is maturing at a different time. So if you had an emergency, then you would pull the one that is just about to expire or the one that has just expired and before you renew it, then you can pull it. Otherwise, if you're pulling from your one-year CD, then you really don't get the traction over there at all. Um, uh, high yield savings account or money market, I think any one of those is great. Yeah, it's just a matter of how accessible is it? How accessible is it? So money market, I like money market because uh, those are intraday rates. Uh I like high yield savings accounts because those are, you know, they also give really good rates. There's there's a company I'm working with right now that's giving 5.25% uh, on their high yield savings. And that's without a minimum. Some of them, you know, they, in order to give you those kind of rates, you have to have like a minimum, you know, amount of money, which is actually out of reach for a lot of people. Um, same thing with money markets. Some, in order to get some good rates, you have to have a little bit of money. So... But here's the thing about money market. Uh, let me talk about that. Especially since a lot of you are moving to Schwab. I know that because we've been using uh, TD Ameritrade. And this is not a plugin. These guys don't pay me for, for, for this. But uh, they, they have a sweeping account. They have a sweeping account that says, if you've got any uninvested cash, right? Say maybe you sold your calls, you've sold your puts, whatever, and you have it uh, sit there overnight. Instead of you know just collecting uh dust um, or soot, <laughs> whichever the case may be, right? Could be either dust or soot, hopefully not soot. You know, you got bunned up, so it's going to be soot. But, but, but anyway, you get the joke. Uh, so instead of sitting there doing nothing, they sweep it into a money market. 
right? So you benefit from the overnight rates. Uh, and that means that your money is actually making you money while you are sleeping, right? Even Robin Hood has a 5% sweep, uh, sweep account. So look into that. Um, I'm going to look for the symbol for Schwab money market fund. You can do, also do that for yourself. You don't have to wait for them to do it. Or you can give them automatic instructions that say, if I have cash inside of my brokerage account, go ahead and sweep it into my money market, right? And then when you buy, you don't have to remember even to call them and tell them the money back. They will just automatically transfer back and forth. So that's that's a good uh, good way. But yeah, the first right thing to do is get an emergency fund. Yeah. Second good thing is don't touch it except for emergencies. Christmas, by the way, is not an emergency. Uh, right? Christmas is not an emergency. It is going to be on December 25 in case you forgot the date. So <laughs> no, that's don't move your money for that. Right there, Jackie? Yeah. So uh, I don't know. What kind of emergencies do you guys have or know about? Why, why, what, 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 do you, what do you put in there? What's, what's an emergency? I'm curious. Car repair. Car repair. That's an emergency. Yeah. Brakes going out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And air conditioning changes, go out. Air conditioning go out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an emergency. Heater going out, yeah. a, ho a hole in the roof, uh, water heater. Uh, an oil change is not an emergency, right? Car maintenance is not an emergency. Car repairs are emergencies. Car maintenance is not. The difference here is that car maintenance ought to be inside of your budget. Right, you know your car needs an oil change. It needs, uh, you know, some some TLC every so often. It needs the tires, so that's in your budget. Now, if the tire blows out, now that's 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 an emergency. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, the same thing. That's that's what I have my uh, my emergency fund for things like. Now, here's what I do. I try to take care of emergencies using current income. If I can not do it, then then I will go over to that emergency fund. And in the last five, six years, I have not had a need to go into that. For me, an emergency fund is more like um, if you lost a job and you're one of the principal owners in the home, most, most homes, they have two incomes. Uh, if you lost your job, how long would it take you to get another job that's paying you just as good if it if you think it's going to take you three months then maybe you need a at least a three to four month emergency fund if you think it's going to take you you know six months then you get the picture right so the more that you have in your fund the better but up to a certain point up to a certain point because if you have such a huge uh, emergency fund, then it is counterproductive, meaning that you're letting a lot of money sit doing nothing. In fact, it is actually deteriorating because of uh, inflation. So if you have a big three to six months uh, emergency fund, at least it's getting you some money in, uh, but don't don't build it too big. Instead, you want to be invest. There's a difference between savings and investment. You want to be doing both, right? You want to be saving and you want to be investing, mostly investing. Yep. Uh, good question on that. I like I like I like those kind of those kind of questions. So, all right. Let's see. Uh, before we go on, any, anything else? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I didn't I didn't catch that. Was was there a question there? I was just saying thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, time. sure. You yeah, sure you're welcome. Yeah, keep that shiny side up, man. Good deal. Good deal. All right. So this market has been kind of uh, all over the place. Yeah. All over the place. And uh, but before we do that, let's first talk about. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here in a second. Somebody yell, shout, say something, do whatever you need to do and say. 
that you can see my screen. So I'm sharing, what am I sharing? Yeah, I'm sharing my Thinkorswim. Yes, and, yes, yes, yes. Awesome, yeah. awesome, awesome, cool. So what am I looking at here? I'm looking at uh, Thinkorswim. And one of the questions that I get a lot, a lot, a lot, because people have access to me. That's the good thing. Um, in my program, you have access to me. I, I, I won't just teach you. Uh, I'll be with you, right? And consistently, I get this. The number one question is, am I making money in this trade or not? That's You'd be surprised. Now, you guys have been around maybe, but uh, for, for the benefit of you know the people that are watching now and they're wondering, what is he talking about? Uh, maybe I should go back uh, a little further. So it's a, it's a, it's 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 basic information. So if you've seen these or you know these before uh, from you know from experience, uh, not a big deal. You can fast forward uh, and catch up later. But uh, in order to buy stocks, right, was, uh, to buy options, you have to have a platform like this one. I'm particularly looking here at Think or Swim. It's made by TD Ameritrade and soon to be Schwab. Uh, but if you have uh, this kind of platform here then this is this is basically what you need to trade on yourself uh, for uh, yeah by yourself remember they always tell you that you know next to a savings account get a brokerage platform yeah a brokerage account so this is where you go and trade i just clicked on trade here that's that's how you get to the options chain so that's a big word for a lot of new people options chain what am i talking about it's where you go buy the stuff that you want to buy. What are you? What stuff are you buying? You're buying options, contracts. You're not buying shares. Right now, I'm looking at AAPL, which is the underlying or the security or the symbol, right? Apple. You all know Apple. It's a really nice fruit company. They sell computers. Uh, maybe maybe you're getting trouble by Apple. No, it's a it's a computer company. <laughs> How about that? So this is the instrument that you're buying when you think that it, you know the price of Apple shares is going to go up uh, from 172, for instance, you know, going up to say 189 or stuff like that. Um, why do I have 189? Uh, clear that. Just to make this correct, what's my, what's, what's my resistance? My resistance is right there. And I'm skipping quite a few things, by the way, uh, but I'll come back and talk about those. So that's my resistance anyway. So if you believe that the price of Apple is going to increase from 172 to 182 or somewhere in between there, then you'll come back and buy a call. Notice that there's calls on the left side, puts on the right side, and uh, you might buy uh, something that is slightly in the money or deep in, or you know, at the money or slightly in the money. How do we know it's slightly in the money or at the money? The strike needs to be less than the current price if you're buying a call. So once again, at the money or slightly in the money, the strike needs to be less than the current price. So the current price is 172. This is the strike. You can see the label right there. You know what? I think I do have a pen. Uh, I do have, let's see. Shapes, yeah, I think I have that. Yeah, that, that's right. That, that's a strike. So those are the strikes. And we are always going to be on the ask column. So you might want to buy the 170 strike. And uh, that's going to cost you roughly $810 uh, for this expiration date. Now, I'm skipping a whole lot of things, but uh, you just need to come to class and we'll fill in the, 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 the gaps. The point I am trying to make is that once you get in, what what next? What if, you know? Why did you just? What does even getting in mean? Right, getting in means that you bought the contract and you're buying it for eight hundred and ten dollars. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're asking. Well, it says eight point one zero. Where did you get to eight hundred and ten? It's because uh, each contract represents represents one hundred shares. So we're multiplying everything by one hundred most of the time. So that would be $810, it would set you back. And then uh, assuming, <clears throat> excuse me, assuming that the price does go up by that $10, 
then uh, you'd start to make about $590. How did I come up with that figure? Yes, I did pull it out of a hat, but not really. Uh, I was looking at this thing called the Delta. And I know that if my price, uh, the price that I'm referring to here is the price of the underlying, the 172, if it goes up by $10, then I know that for each dollar it goes up, I will make 59 cents in premium, which is equivalent to $59 in uh, real money. So $10 times 59 would be $590. Very soon you will learn how to make these calculations either in your head or on your calculator or on your own paper very, very quickly. You need to learn that skill. It is not optional, right? You cannot get by with just assuming or hoping for the best. But I'm coming back here to the question of where do I find all that information? So when I when we do that, when we when we get into that contract, I'm just going to click over here and go ahead and buy this, confirm and send. There's this tab that you need to become very, very familiar with. This is the monitor tab. This monitor tab is where you're going to spend plenty of time, plenty of time analyzing what happened. Uh, and it looks like I was inside of a spy and yep okay so you're going to you're going to spend a lot of time here on the monitor tab the reason I'm, i want to bring this up is you need to know how your things are going uh let me digress for a little bit if you open a business any kind of business whether it's a service uh oriented business or it's a product oriented business you always have a plan and Pretty sure before you open up business, you're going to have some sort of you know crude plan, a plan, a rudimentary plan that that explains explains how you are going to get the money, right? Can I see some nodding heads or say yes, everybody, or if you understand that basic concept? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Everybody. Every. It makes sense that you 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 know you or you have to know how to make that money whatever business that you get into, that's fundamental number one, right? I don't even think that's business one one. That's probably business zero zero one. Well, in trading, it's the same thing. You have to understand how you're making the money. And the very first and most basic is the buy low, sell high, yeah? So you buy low, what is your low? It's how much you paid for it. Over here, we put in a bid of $8.10 there's a likelihood we're going to you know, buy for less. Why? Because the mark is about 8.02. By the way, this limit here means that you want to buy this contract at no more than uh, $8.10. If you get filled uh, at a less lesser amount, well and good, but the system will not try and sell it or sell it to you for more than 8.10. That's what the limit there is all about. Uh, does it happen that you get a better price than the limit? Yeah. In an active market, more than likely you get filled at that asking price. So once you're here in the monitor tab, uh, notice that there's this thing, this this uh, section here called the working orders. Working orders. That basically means, uh, you know, it's equivalent to you in the drive through at uh, Starbucks and you just ordered your Thermo Macchiato and your order is now working. Once you get to the window, and your order is filled and they hand you the, 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 the cup of joe, your order goes into the filled orders. How hard is that? Is that, is that a simple? Hopefully that's a simple explanation, I, I hope. Uh, yes. if, if, if not, somebody let me know that I need to go into more detail. No, it's simple. It's simple, yes. all right. So these words here do not mean anything more than what they represent. Working order simply means that your order has not been processed yet. It is still working. And as soon as it is, you know, uh, as soon as it is filled, it is going to go into the field orders. Field means that it has been executed. You're now owning one contract or however many contracts that you bought. Or in case you sold, they're going to be represented here in the field orders now if for any reason you cancel an order guess what's the way it's going to be right it's going to be in the canceled orders yeah uh it's as simple as that it's not more complicated the next section says rolling strategies 
if you're inside of a trade and we should probably go into on demand and I can show you what a rolling strategy is. It means that you are owning that contract, right? Whether it's a sold position or it's a bought position, uh, then you can do so many, you know, so many things. You can, uh, you can extend the amount of time. For example, if you bought thirty DTE and you decided, you know, what thirty is not enough, I want to actually do a forty-five DTE, or you bought a forty-five originally and you want to now make it a twenty-one or a seven or a zero, whatever the case may be. Uh, then you can roll that position. Rolling is, uh, sim simply put, it's closing one position and opening a new one. However, that is, that's just the simplest explanation. There's, there's more advanced strategies where you can roll for a profit, right? Inside of a profitable position. And you'd be doing that uh, for several reasons. So we do talk about rolling strategies, what they are, um, uh, but take it from me, they are usually a defensive strategy. So there's there's many ways of defending your position using a rolling strategy. Uh, it's not so much of an income-making strategy, even though back in the day, there used to be an income-making strategy using rolling for credit spreads where you know, you're just simply rolling for more credit before you hit the short strike. That's a lot of jargon that I'm talking about right now, but uh, don't want to make it too complicated. So this is where you go to figure out are you making money or not the position statement there's pl day there's pl uh, year to date there's pl percentage there's pl open let me explain each of these things and i'm glad that i actually have some uh, positions in here that uh, some have executed some are yet to execute so let's start with uh let's start with uh i'm going to finish with that one Let's start with PL day. PL day is profit and loss for today. Yeah. What has happened since the market opened today? That's the question you want to ask. And the answer would be found here. Let's give some examples just to you know, give an idea of how that could be, uh, that could impact what you're saying. Let's say you opened this position last week and up until Friday, or up until today, you were up $200, right? So you opened a position last week. Up until today, you're up $200. Uh, but since the day opened today, you have not made any money. So guess what your PL day would be? Somebody type it in the chat. What should PL day today be if today you have not made any money on that or lost any money? Uh, chat is open, by the way. Type type your number there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, should, it, it ought to be zero because nothing has happened. Uh, but what if you saw PL day $10? A positive number, 10. What would that mean? So let's do some math here now. Uh, up until the last trading day, you know that you had made $200. So your PL open was 200. And today your PL day is 10. So really your PL open today should be what? Yeah, $210, right? $210 because it that is cumulative. That cumulative number is actually represented here in PL open. PL open is what is giving you that number. So if you really want to know what is my position giving me? How much have I made on this position? Then you want to look at the PL open and that will give you the, the facts. The PL day might be uh, a little confusing, deceiving. Well, not deceiving. It's just confusing. It's not deceiving. It's confusing because it's only uh, giving you a metric of what happened today. So don't pay too much attention here to the PL day. Instead, you want to pay attention to the PL open. Why do I have the PL day here open? It's because I'm a day trader and sometimes I want to figure out things. So what is this PL YTD? That's profit and loss year to date. That means from January 1 of this year, have I made any money on Apple? Well, actually I've lost $609. Yeah, 609 bucks year to date. Could I have a position that could alter these to make this positive? Yeah, I could. Yeah. Uh, SPY, I've only traded SPY um, today. 
But right now I have a position. Why is it showing up even though we didn't do anything with it today? It's because I have an open position. That means that uh, all your closed positions will not will not will not show up here. Only your open positions. Uh, and you're wondering what you know what kind of system is this that doesn't tell me you know about my positions. Well, this is for today. If you want to go find your historical positions, for example, uh, or transactions, what happened yesterday and beyond that, then you would need to go to account statement, right? Account statement. And then from there, you'll be looking at your cash and sweep. You'll be looking at transactions, trades. Notice here that it is saying one day's back from today. I wonder whether you can see that. Can you see that? Uh Yes, I see. Yeah, you can see mm -hmm. one one day is back from today, and 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 they they made sure to hide it as much as possible from me. <laughs> but you know, unbeknownst to them, I I'm I'm, I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking. So this is one day is back from from today, uh, and, and so you might wonder, uh, I need to see a little bit more. Guess what? All I need to do is just click on it, and change, and it looks like I can go back to, uh. 30 days. Uh, can I go back uh, a little bit more than that? The maximum period length is 370 days. So I can go back one year if I wanted to. Uh, last time I checked, the one year was 364 and a quarter. Or was it 365 and a quarter? I don't know. I'm going to have to talk to Lindell about that. So anyway, you can go back, I don't know, 200 days, and then push enter. Right? So... Now that I, I pushed uh, two hundred dollars, uh, two hundred days back, I can go back and see, you know, all all my transactions back and forth. You know what happened. Uh, maybe that's too much in in four. Maybe I just want to see about three weeks worth of data. Uh, sometimes, when even after pushing twenty one days, you might see too much information. So another way to filter this is. <laughs> uh, see that Lindell uh, is to uh, you know uncheck all of these for me they're all unchecked right but you can see if I if I check all of these things then I'll, I'll have way so much noise I, do, I don't need really need to know the cash balance every day start of business uh, or close of business no uh, so uncheck that uncheck uh, dividends or interest I might be interested in dividends um and check transfers, withdrawals, deposits, and I'm left with just trade and dividends. So you can see that you've cleaned up. This is account statement. From the monitor, if you go to account statement, this is where you can see, for example, here I can uh, you know, do some, some uh, investigative work and see that I bought, right? I bought, uh, what, three of QQQ back on uh, October 19. Bought three QQQ and those were puts. I bought them at 918 and I sold them the following day uh, for $14.19. So I wanted to figure out how much did I make on that. Well, it's simply 1419 minus uh uh 9.18, and that's uh, five dollars and one cents. So I more than likely had a plus five on that, on that QQQ. I think I did this in my life as well. Uh and how long did it take? Basically, it took uh, one day. Yeah, so this was a swing trade. In case you're wondering, do I do swing trades? Yes, I do swing trades as well. So this was a QQQ. Uh, my thesis was that it was going down, and it did. And I was only capturing uh, $5 uh, in premium. That represents $500. Yeah, 500 bucks. So if I wanted to see what exactly happened, how much commission did I pay, and all that good stuff. So that was the account statement. Let me see questions on this. Any questions about my? I see your faces. Okay, there's my camera. There we go. Uh, no questions on this. All right. You're good. So good. that. Go ahead. It's good. <laughs> All good, Deborah. Okay. Yeah, so the uh, the reason I was talking about that is because 
it's a very commonly asked question. Where is my money? What happened? Did I lose? Did I make it? Did I, did I gain? I don't know what happened. So if you're fighting with your platform, you shouldn't be trading live. That's number one. You should be in the paper trading or simulated trading. This is where you learn stuff. This is where you learn where to look, what to look for, where to click, when to click, all that good stuff. All right. Different from trading itself. Trading is, is that extra knowledge that you need either from technical analysis or fundamental analysis that, uh, that will now help you identify what is a good trade. So we talk about uh, good trades. We call them A plus trades. Those are few and far, be you know, far between. Uh, but I teach you how to find those trades and what criteria that you need to go. You've got a step-by-step -step process uh, of identifying, um, you know, a, a good trade. And it also is dependent on how much you're trying to make. We've got certain minimums of how much we're trying to make and we try and uh, just, you know, we wait more than we trade, which means we're trading less, but we're making making a whole lot more. We pause there for questions. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, if you don't have questions, I will so ask. General, them. general question, uh, mm -hmm. Eddie. Maybe someone just throwing it out there. Maybe someone else has the same question. Mm -hmm. How much is uh, what's a good amount? of money to start trading with um, in order to make it seem worthwhile. Okay. So worthwhile here could be relative, but uh, what's a good amount of money? What's realistic? You can start with any amount, but that's not a good answer. That's not the answer you're looking for. You're looking for something hard and fast. You're looking for some numbers. Uh, I suggest most people should start with between $3,000 and $5,000. Okay, between three thousand and five thousand. Initially, in the first few weeks, you will not even be using that whole three thousand. You're more than likely going to be using uh, maybe maybe a thousand or two thousand dollars. So, again, as in any business plan, you have to have some sort of uh, some sort of operating plan. And I'm going to try here and uh, bring up a small spreadsheet that I have that might help. Right. I'm trying to give some context to that question. Yeah. So Jaren is always putting me on the spot. I love it. I love it. I love it there, Jaren. Keep you on so, your toes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keep me on my toes. So uh, her question was, um, you know, she has some money and she wants to find out how much is good enough money. Well, first off, we said three to five thousand. Uh, but what if she has a hundred thousand dollars that she wants to or, or is eligible to be invested? Uh, my answer to that usually is keep the ninety five thousand dollars away from the stock market. That's number one. Yeah, that probably should be number zero. Don't bring it to the stock market. Why are you going to lose it? Because you have no idea what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing yet. So you just need the three to five. Figure out what you're doing, and then you grow that. And soon you will discover you don't even need to bring in that $95,000, right? So if you have 5,000, then uh, what do you need to do? You need to divide it into four buckets, right? Bucket number one is a cash reserve, 20%. So 20% of 5,000 is 1,000. It means that you're probably not going to be spending that 1,000, but it's inside of your trading account. Uh, why do you want to have money that you're not going to use? Sometimes you need more liquidity. Yeah, and there are scenarios where you might find a really good opportunity and it's, it's going to work for you. And then you need to be no more than three positions. Some, some for, for most people, you'd need to be no more than two positions. But this is a general kind of thing. If you're in more than this many positions, then that's a lot to handle. So I would say between two and three positions, that is the sweet spot. I would say about two positions. Uh, until you develop nerves of steel like Jerry. Jerry has got nerves of steel. I mean, that lady will <laughs> buy a call without flinching. Is, is that about right? 
Yeah. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> I'm she, still she, working on it. <laughs> she's working on it. All right. Let's, let, uh, she's working on it. She's working on nerves of steel. That's the idea. Uh, so you you want to equally divide or roughly equally divide, um, you know, the remaining 4,000 divided by three will give you roughly 1,300 plus plus, which means that you can buy stock A for, you You know, you've got a budget of 1,300, stock B, 1,300, and stock C, 1,300. If you are going to do just two stocks, it means that you would have uh, roughly $2,000 available for each stock. Now, that's a little bit on the uh, higher side. So I would say that... Uh, uh, and, and even and even thirteen hundred is still on the higher side. Uh, well, how do I how do I think it's higher? Because we're talking about twenty percent of your portfolio, and we already know that twenty percent of your portfolio is a thousand. So if you're spending, you know, more than twenty percent on a, on a single position, you're already being risky. But this is a calculated risk. So I would be looking for stocks and options contracts that are not going to cost me more than $1,300 for each position. It means most of the time I will be able to only afford one contract, which is where I should be when I'm starting out. Yeah. So to give context, you know, a little bit more context to, to that detail, you need something that is helping you, you know, navigate this kind of thing. Let's say, um, uh, Let's see, you want to trade. What do you want to trade? What do you normally trade? What's the last thing that you traded there, Jerry? Um, spy. Spy. Okay, spy is right there. So spy at the moment is costing uh, $421.19. How do I know that? It's because my spreadsheet is pulling these data live. Yeah, that's right. And then you want to work out, we already know that the ATR is 5.29. Uh, well, there's a slight discrepancy. It might be in my formula. You never know. And then you want to define your expected move. Now, from here all the way down to the end is what we talk about in the class. We you know what do we, what's our target support and resistance? What is the you know move? What is the strike we're going to choose? Uh, the expiration, the delta, all of these things. I will give you the blueprint uh, of what to do, how to do it, when to do it, until you identify that number over here what your estimated profit is and that's important so this worksheet over here will help you uh, estimate what your weekly take might be this is on a good uh, basis the best case scenario let's put it that way we will also talk about the risk how much to risk uh, when do you know that your trade is not going well yeah. Is there any reason to have any hope or to use hope? Well, we should always have hope, but is there any reason to, to bring that into the picture? Well, you will shortly find out and the answer is no, right? So we don't use hope. We don't use um, intangible scenarios where we think, well, this is going to happen or, you know, no, we, we are always going to be objective uh, and be very, very, uh, very, we're going to be quick, quick to cut losses. We're going to be quick also to take profit. Um, but in both cases, they're going to be calculated. So because we understand that this is a this is a business that gives and takes, we want to be more on the profit side than on the uh, on the losing side. So we we talk about this section here a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, obviously, there's more to it. You know, where you know how do all these things affect. Uh, what we're doing, but uh, you know, from from point L all the way to the end, that's that's where we're going to spend a lot of time. So, Jerry, to answer your question, three to five k, can you start with a thousand dollars? Obviously, if you have a thousand dollars, you can go buy a thousand dollars stock or options contract. Is that enough? Is that a good strategy? It means you're going to be sitting on the edge of your seat, biting your nails if you have any. So, you know, the plus side is you know, no nail salon expenses over there. Uh, well, negative side is that you know no nails. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I am a testament that if you have less than three to five, you can mm -hmm. definitely do it and build from there. Absolutely. Um. Yep. So yeah, thank you for that. Is this spreadsheet in our? It is. Folder? It, okay. It cool. is available to the alumni. Yes. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, thousand thousand dollars stock. Uh, 
Uh, I'll just go over here to, uh, let's see, I'll go to, but I'll go to QQQ. QQQ here is on the chats. I had plotted here. Let me go ahead and clear this screen. Clear the drawing set. This is from that last trade, by the way, that I projected uh, a movement down to 538, exceeded it by leaps and bounds, made $500. Obviously, I could have made a lot more, but uh, I am I'm, uh, of the opinion that if you hit your target, you should just get out, right? Take it and run. But that was a good trade. Uh, it hit that spot. So, yep. All right, so QQQ here, if I go over to the options chain, uh, let me look at one more thing, by the way, before we do that. Uh, look at my statement. And I want to double check something here. All right. On this particular one, uh, I actually did spend roughly $2,700, right? Uh, twenty seven hundred dollars on one on three contracts, but each contract did cost me nine dollars and eighteen cents. So, if you had only one thousand dollars in your account, yes, you could have done this trade, but you would you would uh, have uh, uh, what would you have done? You'd have made exceeded your twenty percent to the you'd side. have yeah because you're using almost a hundred percent, which gives you, you know very very little room to recover if something you know did happen, and you notice that even though you could have made five hundred dollars, you know the fourteen here minus nine that's five hundred dollars per contract, uh, different from the person who did three, I did three, so that was actually what fifteen hundred dollars total on this trade. Uh, so that's a good one, but this is evidence that you can you can make uh, a trade with less than a thousand dollars. If I go to the actual, let me first uh, look at the chart here. Uh, what do we think price is going to do here? Let's see. I'm just going to do a trade example here. So this is the current price, right? This is the current price. I'm just going to label that as C U R R E N T price. And I'm not doing anything fancy here, guys. I'm just really marking what the current price is. If you're watching this for the first time, how do I know what the current price is? That's where the, you know, I'm looking at the right side on this axis and I see 354.6 is highlighted. It's actually standing out a little bit. I can also look at my watch list and see that, uh, uh, see that that's the current price. I can also look at the top over here and see current price is 354. Uh, that's number one. Number two is where do I think this is going? And this is where we have to understand support and resistance. So there's a little bit of a science here to figure out what the support is, where the resistance it is. Uh, and then we use that to determine what the expected move is. So you can imagine that your support and your resistance become targets. Either the price is going up, in which case, the resistance would be your target or price is going down, then the support would be your target. Uh, what price are we talking about going up or down? We're talking about this 354.60 or, yeah, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about the price of the, of, uh, uh, the contract. We're talking about the price of this contract, this underlying. I like to call them underlying. That's what they're called. Uh, then we switch our minds over when we go over to the trade and we pick a date here. I'm going to pick, say, 41 days. Uh, then this is what we are actually trading, either the 1026 or the 1256 on the 354 contract. If we think price is going to go up, then that would be the contract over there. If we thought price was going to go down, then we'd be looking at the 355 contract. Yeah. So... I forgot what question was I trying to answer. I was trying to see how much we can spend. So you can see here, I would need uh, just slightly over a thousand dollars in order to trade the put, and I would need uh, roughly twelve hundred fifty-six dollars to trade the call. Yeah. So this might not be be your best first trade. Instead, you might uh, go for something like spy. Oh, she did tell me that she did spy. 
Yeah. Well, same yeah. story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same story here. At the money calls are roughly, you know, just under thirteen hundred bucks. Puts are roughly nine hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, nine hundred fifty dollars. So would I would you notice also that the further out that I go, meaning in terms of days to exploration, the more expensive they are. So forty one days out from today, calls are costing roughly thirteen hundred bucks. Three days from today, calls the same the same four hundred and twenty strike on the calls is now costing three hundred and forty five dollars, three hundred forty four dollars. Uh, why would I spend twelve hundred dollars versus three hundred forty five dollars? Why would I do that? If the underlying stock moved two dollars. I will make the same $100 whether I buy the December 1 contract or the October 24 contract. So why could I do that? Uh, well, I'd have to have super bullish confidence that within three days that it is actually going to move $2 and that the volatility is not going to stop me out. That's that's having really, really, really bullish confidence, right? That's having really bullish confidence. If I wasn't so confident and I don't know, then I need more time. So that is why I would go out and a whole 41 days and understanding that going up or going down here doesn't take that long, but it gives me enough time to, to manage that risk. Right or pivot or do something else. So you want you always want to give yourself more time, and obviously that costs money. So again, we we're going back to Jaren's question: is how much money do I need to trade, and where do I spend it? So you can see that yeah, you 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 could buy it for three hundred forty four dollars. You know what? You could even buy it for seventy cents or seventy dollars, way out of the money. Right? This is now in the territory of uh, don't do that. Yeah, you also have to understand the concept of why is this out of the money? Why is this shaded black? Why is this shaded purple? Uh, and that's in the money on the calls with the purple background. Where's my pen? Kind of all over the place, but uh, I understand that I have some new people and they need to know. So just to give you a you know, quick crash course on moneyness, that's a word we made up yesterday. So moneyness, that all, all of that, for as long as we're talking about calls, then you can consider that all these strikes are in the money, right? That's in the money. If we're considering uh, puts, right? So if we want to talk about puts, then uh, all of this is oh, not there. Uh, where's my pen? Here we go. So if we're talking about puts, then uh, this is what is uh, in the money, right? So, and I think we talked about it a little bit earlier. We said that for as long as the strike, right? This is a strike that I'm referring to. For as long as the strike is above the current price for puts, then that's in the money. So you notice everything above 421 uh, has, a, I'm going to call this purple background, uh, and that's in the money. We're talking about puts, we're talking about puts. If we're talking about calls, then you notice that the strike has to be less than the current price. There's a method to this madness, very distinct method to this madness. So you do have to understand all these nuances and you know it sounds like a lot of information but uh once once you get it and we'll break it down at every step we'll figure out why is it that you know something is considered in the money why is it that we have to go for that instead of something that is out of the money even though potentially it could cost us way much less 
what is the risk and how do we balance that risk? And that's what options with Eddie is all about. That's that's, that's what, what what I teach in class and what we practice. So, all right, uh, it's 12.05. So I'll tell you what, we'll do, we'll do a few questions and then call it a Saturday. How about that? Do a few questions and call it a Saturday. So I'm gonna stop sharing here so I can see your faces. There you go. And let me catch up on the chat. Uh, looks like, uh, yep, no questions in the chat. No questions out there. Cool. All right. All right. So no questions. I just for... wanted to know how can we find. Go ahead. So I just wanted to know. Um regarding your classes like the schedule for how do i go out how do i go about finding that out okay so okay. my classes are at least two a month uh usually in the beginning and somewhere in the middle and they're mondays and wednesdays i've got two particular uh we've got two particular times six and seven thirty so Meaning they start at six and start at seven thirty. Is that what correct. that means? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jackie. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do I give one-on-one -on -one help understanding? Yes, I do. If if you need help understanding Think or Swim, I will definitely make the time because you you have that's that's the entry point. Uh, that is the entry point for for learning this whole thing. I'm catching up over here. So yeah, new market, new rules. Uh, if you've been in this market for for a minute or two, you know that uh, back in 2019, 2020, it used to be you throw a dot in the you know against the options and you pick whatever strike, whatever call. And you come back in the afternoon, you've made some money, right? That used to be like that. So it was a call, so it was a bull market. And then came 2021, uh, things changed. And this time we were buying puts. And then 2022 and 23, we have no idea. Then just recently, we've just been seeing the market, you know, kind of all over the place. And we don't even know where it's going. So let me, let me see here what we're doing. I'm going to share my screen here again. Uh, share uh, share this bad boy. Yep. So I'm going to look at S and P 500. Uh, this is an index. Uh, does anybody trade the S and P 500? I'll be shocked if anybody does. Yes. Oh my goodness! Really? No, you don't. You don't. Well, actually, yes, I think most of you do. So S&P 500 is very, very, very popular. I think anybody who goes into the stock market within 10 minutes of learning anything about it, they hear the word SPX. They check to make sure it's not a typo, and it's not. It's SPX, S&P 500. Uh, but it tells us a lot because it represents 500 of the strongest companies in the U.S., and it has a sister called the Dow Jones, which is a DJI, which represents 30 of some of the strongest companies or the you know, financially, that's what I mean, financially strong companies in the US, 30 uh, are in the Dow Jones. And you can trade them. You can trade all of them without buying each individual stock for those companies. So we notice that, let me go here to a three-year chart, and it's not even doing justice here because uh, it used to be a line going up. Now it's just up and down, up and down, especially the last couple of years. So what what's what's new? For most of you, you were used to something starting here and going all the way up and keep, just kept going up. If it did come back, it, you know, down, it came down a little bit and then kept, continued going up. That's that's the experience for a lot of people who've been trading the last few years. Well, now this market 
has got uh, different characteristics. It's more open. There are more people who have access to it, uh, specifically retail traders like you and I, who don't have millions and millions of dollars uh, to trade. Instead, we have you know thousands of dollars, right? Not hundreds, thousands of dollars to trade. Uh, I'm talking about the one to five thousand dollars. I'm not talking about hundreds of thousands, right? And we used to be able to confidently buy a call, a 45-day call, and wait a few days, and it's good. Well, now things are not as rosy. Instead, what's been happening, uh, and I'm, I'm looking here, by the way, at the day time frame, if you're looking at this for the very first time, this is the day time frame, meaning that one candle it represents one business, one trading day. And to change that, I can simply go here to the five days, 15 minutes, meaning that each candle is going to be representing 15 minutes, but I'm going to be looking at a five-day span. So you can see that I might buy something here on Wednesday and thinking that I bought a put, but instead what happens? It goes all the way up and then maybe goes down. It doesn't come all the way down to where I wanted it to. The market also has changed a little bit in the sense that we used to we used to almost always close the gaps almost guaranteed in the same day 99% of the time for some symbols they still do that uh but for the S&P they we're not always closing the gap and that's messing with a lot of people or, Eddie, can I ask you a question regarding yeah, sure. that mm -hmm. regarding the the gap so I'm like would when you say close the gap, like, mm, oh, you can't see my cursor. The date, let's see, Wednesday, and then says 10, because I'm looking at a gap. I can't see the date on it. But when you say close the, the gap, do you mean the body of the candle has to close the gap or even like the wigs? It would, like, say if the wigs, went all the way up is that part of closing the gap or no it's closing the gap would be like the body yes that's exactly what i'm looking at okay yeah i'm going to use this as an example right here okay so in this uh -huh. particular so in this particular case you notice that there's a small gap over here of on this day mm -hmm. uh from uh, 46 31 and uh the gap is like body to body right but we're trying to figure out is this gap closed and when you look to the right of it your question is, does this week here constitute closing the gap? Yes. That is, your, that is your question. Okay. Well, it's a good question. If I were to stand right here where my crosshairs are right now, and I had a flashlight pointing to the left, would the guy on this side see it? Ask that question again. All right. So, so I'm standing right at the crosshairs where you see my cursor. And I'm pointing my flashlight left, and there's a there's a dude on the other side of the gap. Uh, do you think he's going to see the light, or is it being blocked by the gap by the by the wick. by the wick? It's been is blocked. It, blocked by the yeah, wick? It, it is blocked, right? So he can't see the light. So what I'm looking for is, or if I were to, <laughs> no, maybe that's not a good example. Uh, sometimes I laugh at my own jokes as they are forming in my mind. No, uh, if you were to identify where you can go through that line, if you cannot go through this, anything blocking you, then that gap should be considered closed. So you don't, you don't need a solid candle. I think that's what you're trying to find, find out. You don't need yeah. a solid candle to to say that this can that this uh, gap is closed. Okay, so got yeah, it. just 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 a week. It could be a week going down and a week going up, or it could be a solid, uh, you know, uh, solid candle like uh, like in this particular instance over here. This gap was closed by solid candles, right? Yes. Yep. So no, they don't have to be solid. They can be weeks. Okay. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. And uh, you remember what I was trying to say? Uh, yeah. So new ways of trading. You have to take profit when you see profit. And 
it also means that you have to define that profit more times than not. You have to define it in advance and you can't be as aggressive as we used to be. So if you have the potential for, say, making $500, then you should be happy with a little less because what's been happening is that price has been moving in one direction and then turning around. I'm going to give Apple here as an example. Uh, Apple is one of the things, it's one of those that I trade a lot uh, just because it's it's a healthy it's a healthy company and you can see even in the day time frame that it's got some really nice well defined i call them w's right? it's going up it's going down it's going up it's going you know down up and so on and so forth so i can project quite easily what it's going to do but sometimes i'm not able to project that it is going to come back up instead it disappoints and goes all the way down Give you a good example here is Boeing, B A, right? Boeing is an airplane maker, and this is the day time frame for. I'm gonna go here for about eighteen months. Uh, up until recently, we were in a range starting from January. We were in a range of, you know, up and down movements, very very consistently making the money on the way up, on the way down, on the way up on the way down until it broke out uh, sometime on July. It broke out and went all the way to the top. And then it, you know, played up and down, corrected itself. And I want to call this overcorrection, overcorrection. Yeah. So I still think that Boeing is a great company. We all know it's a great company. They continue to make some of, you know, one of the best airplanes in the world. And um, they're not going anywhere. As a matter of fact, they have one of the longest buildings in the world, if, if that's anything to you. <laughs> worthy of note. Did you, did you guys know that? Did anybody know that? That uh, they have the longest building in the world in uh, Everett, Washington? No. Yeah. No, I didn't it, know that. Yeah, it is so long, it actually curves or follows the curvature of the earth. Fact. Yeah fact so uh, yeah it's got that uh, genius book of uh, world book of records anyway and their so, headquarters is in st louis uh their headquarters is not in st louis no it, oh it's it? not no. <laughs> okay yeah. never mind <laughs> yeah their headquarters is in washington washington state i happen to know that because i worked for boeing okay uh, yeah and i uh, also worked for boeing when i was in st louis on the fa-18 so yeah, they make uh, they make uh, is it the F eighteen or is it sixteen yeah, in Saint Yeah, Louis? I think it's the one of those. Five one of those. Planes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You would think that uh, their headquarters is in Saint Louis because of their size over there in Hazelwood, but uh, no, not not a chance. I just learned something new. I just knew we were. Me too, and I went to school in Saint Louis, and I'm yeah. like, oh. yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. It's not just me. <laughs> nope, it wasn't. Uh, yeah, they're pretty big. They have a huge presence. Uh, one might also be mistaken that uh, their plant in North Carolina is also, you know, headquarters because of the size. But no, headquarters is uh, Everett, Washington. Uh, that's where they make the 787, the, the Dreamliner, and the 747. So. 787, 747, and a few others. So anyway, enough about that. Uh, but they broke out. So why, why is what's going on here? Well, could be anything. Could be that they lost a contract or something, uh, or just following the trend. So the point here is going back now to the S and P. Since we can, you know, see without going into each individual stock, we can just look at the S and P and see what's really happening. And I'm going to go back here to the nine month. Uh, we're following this trend. What you have to do is, is 45 to 90 days still the, still the way to go? I think it is. I believe it is, right? But does that mean you have to stay that long? That answer is dis, you know, decisively no. Don't plan on being inside of a trade longer than two weeks. If you're inside of that trade longer, you know, two weeks and it's not performing or you have not filled your target, it is not a good trade. 
and uh, we'll show you what a good trade is all about. Most good trades are not going to take that long. They will usually take about, you know, by design, maybe two or three days. Uh, best case scenario is they will execute open and close in the same day. So PDT there, but you don't have to have PDT in order to make these trades. You can plan them in a way that uh, you're never, never running out of your PDT. PDT, by the way, if you've never heard about it, is Pattern Day Trader, in case you're watching this for the first time. Um, by the way, guys, uh, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe to, to my channel. It does help me out. Push those likes, push those comments. Uh, we'll, we appreciate them. So to you, uh, Jackie, thanks for reminding me about that uh, new ways of trading. That that's That's for sure one way that you could uh, help yourself out is by not staying in the trade too long. Uh, number one, uh, the second thing is uh, you're familiar with my A plus trades. Make sure that you're getting in on those A plus trades. Remember that uh, the plus ten used to be used to be good. Uh, we're now not doing plus ten. We're doing seventeen. That's the new black, right, Jackie? You remember that? Got the memo? She's still new 17. What are we talking about? 17 plus 17. Yeah. Plus 17. Uh plus 17. 17 points of movement. Oh, oh, oh okay. Got you. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think Jackie might have dropped off. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So there's there's those new rules that that we want to to look at uh and and practice so that we can get those, we can capture those profits. Um, and then obviously don't trade on FOMC days. This was an F Thursday was an FOMC day, I believe. Went all the way down, even though we had no idea whether it was going to go up or down, but uh, it showed its face after, you know, you know fairly quickly from, from 12 o'clock when uh, Jerome Powell, chairman of the Fed, uh, gave his comments. So I'm going to leave it here now. Uh, what uh, what kind of questions do you have on that? Chat. So you think we, we turned around Monday? Uh, I would. I mean, is I that is support? I would, I would say that uh, we have hit this support uh, pretty hard. Yeah, and we've closed an important gap here from June that was, uh, you know, very elusive. So we, we hit this June, which was a key mark, and we've done this on one, two, three, four, and yesterday was the fifth day, right? So if we are to look at this formation, we're looking for a double bottom. This is the first bottom, this is the second bottom, bottom. And if we break the trend, then we're looking more than likely at 4,100. Do I think we're going to go 100 points down? I don't know. Uh, it's possible. I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. So, uh, Amazon, somebody is asking whether Amazon is going to make their earnings next week. I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> Linda wants me to look into my crystal ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't have one. <laughs> Go answer. Yeah. I don't have one. I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, and uh, I'll I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll look at it next week. How about that? I'll give you an answer next <laughs> week uh, there, Linda. For sure. For sure. <laughs> so tread carefully. Tread carefully. Uh, one more thing here about the way we trade these days is uh, don't put a whole lot of money in your trades. This is from a risk management perspective. So if you're used to, say, putting or buying a $1,500 contract, try and go less. Try and go less, maybe 1000 maybe 500 This is They're there. And this is so that if in case you don't have a good risk management plan, then you would not be losing so much. Yeah. So we want to risk less, but you know, get get more of the same, but risk less for sure. 
uh, it's important because I've, I'm seeing a lot of people telling me, you know, I, I had a $3,000 to $5,000 $5, account. In the beginning, it was well. I made that money and uh, now it's gone. Is it that I'm making bad choices? Is it that, you know, what's happening? I don't think they're making really bad choices, but I think that uh, they want, what we really need is to be a little bit more careful, just uh, uh, and what does that mean? What does being more careful mean? It means that you have to have a tight man risk management plan. Uh, get with me if you need one. Get with me seriously. Let's let's talk about it. I don't want you losing money. If anything, if I can help you not lose the money, not even make the money, just if I can help you not lose the money, I think that would make my day. Make your day too. So don't be shy. Hit me up. Go to optionswitheddy.com. Click on that. Give me 20 minutes and... Uh, for sure, we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. Let me answer one question here on the chat that's sent to me directly. Uh, do I give one-on-one -on -one help uh, with understanding TOS? Yes, I do. So if you need that, you want to book a consultation with me, uh, I will help you. If you're already in my class, uh, there's no additional cost. So... I believe that is... Uh, all right, Jackie's here. She has no, uh, she's having mic issues. All right. Is your microphone on? Uh, or is your speakers on? Or is, the, or is your speaker <laughs> on or off? You know, Clarence has got some experience on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did you mean by 17 points? Uh, 17 points. So we'll talk about that in uh, class there, Erica. Okay. Yeah. Thank it's you. A, it's, a, it's a secret sauce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. We've got, we've got formulas and uh, statistics that help us, uh, improve our odds of success, right? You want to use everything, everything that you can to give you a higher probability of profit. So we have, we've, we've done some. You know, we've got some experience in that area. We've got statistics to show it. And it helps us identify the minimums that we need to meet in order to make a consistent uh, amount of money. Because when you go to the options chain uh, and you trade, you, anybody can trade and make 100 bucks, 200 bucks. You know, not a big deal, I think. Right? It may be a big deal these days but uh, we believe that there is more there is more to just making two three hundred bucks we want you to make a healthy amount of money trading less right less often we don't want you glued to your computer all day long you've got things to do you've got golf to play you've got gardens to go tend yeah so basically you're working smart or trading smart that's what we mean there erica Cool. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. welcome. All right, guys, it's been about an hour and a half, and uh, it's a Saturday. By the way, guys, where's my where's my camera? The Steelers, right there. Where is it? Steelers, right there. You still in the lead? Still, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I I gotta check. <laughs> Yeah, but you know whether they're doing well, no, not doing well. I support them. I like them, it's the Steelers. So go Chiefs. Go Chiefs. Yeah, Chiefs are good. Dude. They 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 can kick ball. I'm with Malone. Uh, yeah, he's good. He's all right. <laughs> cool. All right, guys, it's been real. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. And uh, will I post this online? I might. If you registered, which most of you did, you will get a link. If not, we'll see about that. See you, right, guys. Tuesday. See you Tuesday morning. Uh, we'll see you Tuesday morning. What's happening Tuesday morning? Oh, I did say I did. I did say I was going to be online Tuesday morning, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. More than likely, I will be. So, yeah. If in case you're wondering what's happening Tuesday morning, is uh, we do hold live classes, not live classes, live trading, uh, every once. Oh, there we go, Steelers! Yay! <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, she's a Steelers fan too. I did not know that. <laughs> uh, 
uh, yeah, once a week on Thursday mornings, we have live trading for about an hour, an hour and a half, maybe two. Um, and uh, this last Thursday, I think I was traveling. Yeah, I was traveling. So I was not able to give a full, you know, my full attention. In any case, there was FOMC activity. I did not trade. Good thing I did not. Um, but I needed uh, some people are new and they want to trade for the very first time live. So I said I'd hold their hands on Tuesday morning. So if you're in my class, um, yeah, Tuesday I'll be live. We'll see that. Cool. All right, guys, you have a great weekend. Keep the shiny side up and adios, amigos. All right.